Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening for those of you who are in Central Asia. Thank you for joining us for this uh, first seminar of the year of the Central Asia program done in partnership with Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Davis Center at Harvard University, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and the Oxford Society for Central Asian Affairs to discuss the results and the, situ the, the, the situation in Kazakhstan and the, the discussion on the election, immediate reaction inside and for the future development of Kazakhstan. We have three great speakers this morning with us, and I will give them the floor for speaking about 10 minutes each before opening for the, uh, the floor for a Q&A session that I will be uh, moderating. First, to give the floor and welcome Evgeny Jodvis, a prominent human rights lawyer and current director of the Kazakhstan International Bureau for Human Rights and the Rule of Law. Then we will hear from Toro Guldorov, who has been the director of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Kazakh Service since 2014, and who were before based for several years in Bishkek. And last but not least, I will give the floor to Nargis Kasenova, Senior Fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University and Associate Professor at Kimet. So without further ado, because we just have one hour and I don't want to take too much time, I would like to give the floor to our speaker. So once again, welcome. And Evgeny, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marlene. Good evening, good morning to all participants and to all viewers and those who want to know something about the elections which uh, took place uh, two days ago. First of all, I want to express my personal point of view. I do not consider it as elections. It's rather more looking like appointment of the members of the Majlis uh, of the lower chamber of the parliament and Maslikas, local legislatures, because uh, firstly, there was no opposition participating in these elections at all. And it is not only because the opposition don't want to boycott these elections, but because they, there is no any space for political competition as such. Uh, the the uh, legislation on political parties is very uh, repressive and restrictive. It's very difficult to register political party uh, from 2006 to 2012. The opposition political party ALGA tries to register for six years until it was banned for so-called extremism without any evidence. The, uh, then the Democratic Party of Kazakhstan and other new oppositional party was not even able to convene last year to, to organize the party. That's, there was no practical opposition or political party. So only one party which boycotted the elections, United Social Democratic, all national Social Democratic Party, uh, is really marginalized, very weak, and was not visible in the political space for uh, two or three years, uh, really. That there was no opposition. Secondly, uh, we have the serious problems with the media, because there is no electronic, uh, independent electronic media like radio and TV. And as a result of that, uh, the Kazakhstan, with its uh, huge territory, two and a half million square kilometers, and rather dispersed population, uh, about 19 million, uh, the only access to waters is through the media, because it's very difficult physically to have the access to the waters. And if you do not have access to the nationwide media, then you have no access to water. So and finally, the elections took place in the winter when it is very cold in the north and the east, and plus uh, pandemic. That's all together creates the practically the elections without any choice and all five parties which took part in these elections were clearly pro-governmental either three parties which were already being represented in the parliament and they have to mention that uh, uh, for many years more than for 10 years there was no any opposition neither in the parliament nor in the local legislature that's the results of elections were absolutely predictable the same parties are in the parliament. And, uh, and uh, what I uh, want to mention more, it's about the turnout. For example, in Almaty, in many uh, polling uh, places, the turnout was 10% or less. 
that's it was uh, uh, there was no any kind of interest in these elections and there was practically no campaigning because we could not see any campaigning any billboards real billboards or real debates and political debates are not visible in kazakhstani informational space for also for many years the only interest which i do have in that regard was not the results of the elections uh, because as you know 100 percent uh electoral system is uh, proportional it means that it's only party list and not only party list but closed party list you don't know who will be the members of the parliament until the party will not uh, uh, design these people after the results of the elections will be counted that's uh, the only what i'm interested in uh, are the real composition of the maslihats and of the majlis personally because it will reflect, to a certain extent, in my opinion, it will reflect the, let's say, so, some kinds of checks and balances inside the elite between the different clan groups, regional elites, uh, financial groups, how they will be represented in the uh, majlis, which, to a certain extent, is getting more power uh, in comparison with the Nazarbayev era. And this is my second probably phases, second point which I want to address, what will be after the elections? It's clear that we still are living in the very complicated two heads system, where of course the first president have a strong influence as on the political party Nuratan, which he is the head of, the chairman of, and to, of course, to choosing who will be the members of the parliament. He, is the, uh, he controls the uh, Security Council, which is composed out of the representative of the key uh, four structures. And at the same time, the current president wants to move forward and to conduct certain reforms because he has to. He is more, let's say, so operational uh, president. He is looking for the, uh, let's say, so for uh, strengthening the statehood and for making some economical and especially political reforms but all his efforts are to a certain extent limited because he uh, the uh, uh, the first chamber of this political system is uh, concerned about its safety and the safety of their assets and the economical wealth they got through the 90s that is very complicated system with the number of challenges and now i want to turn to some challenges of course we are facing economical challenges because the pandemic and the uh, fall of the uh, oil prices all these together create certain problems for economical growth and economical problems are growing secondly it's social problems the problems especially in the rural areas especially after the pandemic uh, will be over a lot of problems for the small and medium businesses and finally, there are serious problems with the ability of the state institutions to fulfill its duties, especially when we're talking about law enforcement, those uh, institutions which have to maintain justice about judiciary and so on. That's the reforms, structural reforms, institutional reforms, legal reforms are necessary. Uh, and uh, the authorities think that they could do it keeping full control over all branches of power. That's it's typical authoritarian states where these elections have nothing to do with the real elections and with, without any in, uh, informative and uh, 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 respected choice of the people. But at the same time, the ruling elite is thinking about uh, not shaking the whole system, but moving forward. How it will happen, how it will be, it's very difficult to say. But finally, we have to keep in mind that there are uh, some kind of growing protest potential, especially among the youth, which are tired of this old uh, type uh, leadership. And there is more and more problems which are growing, especially in social networks, it's visible. That's a lot of challenges. The, how the system will develop, very difficult to say. Elections change very small in that direction in that sense but of course we will see it how the 
parliament and the local legislatures will be uh, uh, compiled after the, we will know personalities. And then we will see how the system, uh, let's say how these checks and balances inside the elite was drawn and how the system will go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evgeny, for this wonderful uh, overview of the situation. I now would like to give the floor to Toropol. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, colleagues. I'm, um, I agree with um, uh, Evgeny Shofti that we cannot call it um, elections. Um, same three parties um, which were in parliament since 2012 are again in Majelis with uh, more or less same uh, amount of seats. Um, basically, nothing has changed. Um, I would like to start with um, uh, three main uh, conclusions that uh, I made for myself after this um, uh, elections. First of all, the concept of the uh, listening state, uh, which was declared by President Kasim Jamal Tokayev, did not work. Uh, these elections um, showed the um, enormous, huge gap of, um, uh, if you want, a big wall between the state and people. And these elections, uh, second one, will be remembered with unprecedented number of obstacles and difficulties created mainly by the electoral, electoral authorities, uh, I mean, Central Election Commission, to keep independent observers and journalists away uh, from the voting process. And third one is uh, there were no independent exit polls or opinion polls before the election day on, on election day. And we were deprived of knowledge uh, about the real mood of the society about elections ahead of the process itself and the real number of votes uh, right after election. Uh, now, um, a little bit more detailed about the first one. Uh, we can say that uh, President Tokayev's concept of listening state failed. He declared it right after the first, um, this early presidential elections in June 2019, uh, when Tokayev became the second president of Kazakhstan after Nusultan Nazarbayev in 30 years. And the main idea of the concept was to uh, kind of establish a new political culture through dialogue between the state and people. And the president uh, then, back then, he said, we should not be uh, afraid of alternative opinion or uh, disagreement. Uh, he uh, in initiated an instrument to implement this uh, concept, the so-called National Council of Public Trust was uh, created. Later, even uh, changes made uh, to the law on freedom of assembly protests. Those were good ideas, of course, but they did not establish a, a new political culture as it was promised. For instance, the changes of the law about protest rallies were made during the state of emergency in coronavirus quarantine. Uh, civil society, human rights defenders and political analysts, um, and among them uh, a well-respected Evgeny Shoftis, criticized their uh, changes, calling them as a cosmetic or dry declaration. Unfortunately, those uh, concerns and criticism were not heard. Authorities did not listen to people. And local and international human rights organizations have been telling about growing number of arrests among activists, uh, opposition supporters, or just those who uh, were criticizing their forums. Just one example, according to Arruhaq rights organization, last year in August and September, overall uh, 168 people were punished for their political activities. And two, um, two days ago, on the election day, there were at least 100 detentions of protesters in different cities of the country. This is the number that we, uh, our federal uh, Kazakh service journalists, uh, have witnessed ourselves and counted. Uh, Well-known human rights defender Bakhjan Turegozhno, for example, today she told that um, uh, she told about more than 360 detentions. Uh, how many people uh, were detained? In reality, we don't know. Uh, the special police forces also surrounded protesters in Almaty and kept them about nine hours in the ring. Uh, this maneuver uh, was a law enforcement tactic called kettling, and um, the police uh, encircled protesters to, um, so that they have no way to exit from the ring. And this happened just a couple of hours after President Tokayev told uh, our journalist in Nur Sultan that there will be no persecution of uh, protesters 
on election day. And the second uh, point that um, these elections will be remembered uh, with unprecedented number of obstacles and difficulties created uh, mainly by the Central Election Commission as well as other state bodies. Overall, this uh, was the second time when we could see a great number of people trying to register themselves as an independent observer in elections. Last time it was during the presidential elections of 2019, and surprisingly, um, it worked. Uh, they could um, register different irregularities, which seriously concerned authorities. That is why at this time with, we saw um, different new challenges um, for observers. They were warning uh, letters from tax authorities against NGOs uh, on mistakes in, in their financial reports in December, uh, smear attacks in social media, personal threats, etc. And on um, 4th of um, December, uh, the Central Election Commission announced new rules for independent observation, um, where it said that only those organizations um, that have observation in their uh, charter can send the observers. Um, like if it is uh, said that they will have observation. So there were some funny requirements like taking photo of or video of the person voting only with uh, their permission. Um, it is interesting how to ask a permission from the person committing crime, for instance. And the last uh, but not least is uh, the coronavirus negative test result. It became the huge problem for many observers and journalists on the day of voting, uh, among them uh, several uh, my colleagues from Azadbek. And very shortly about the last point, um, independent exit polls or um, other opinion polls. There are seven, seven pro-governmental organizations who were eligible to carry the exit polls. And three of them uh, conducted the polls and showed almost the same results which did not differ much from the official results given by the Central Election Commission today, for example. A uh, very similar situation uh, was uh, with opinion polls before elections, but only today uh, we heard about the independent polls uh, from Sanj Research Center. Uh, there were results um, different, of course. Um, uh, they said uh, that the turnout was less than 45%. Uh, the winner, Nusult Nuratan, uh, according to this polls, uh, received about 56% uh, when officially it received 71%. Uh, percent. So, resuming uh, everything, I would say that uh, Kazakhstani voters, uh, they were deprived of knowledge about the real mood uh, of the society, about elections ahead of the process. And uh, the real number of votes uh, right after elections, authorities did everything uh, to keep public away from the knowledge about elections? If so, um, there is a legitimate question. Uh, what was the point? And uh, the answer, I think, more or less clear for Kazakhstanis, um, probably there is no point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toroko, for your presentation. And I now would like to give the floor to Nargis Kasenova. And at the same time, I'm inviting uh, our audience to begin asking questions and comments in the chat box. Nargis, the floor is yours. Yes. And thank you very much, Marlene. Um, well, I, I fully agree with the assessment of the elections by uh, Evgeny and Tarkul. Um, I think they do leave a very bad, um, bad aftertaste. Uh, and that was particularly disappointing since there were certain expectations created at the outset of uh, uh, Takayev's presidency that there will be certain liberalization and certain uh, certain openings and uh, we were promised a package of political reforms and uh, uh, supposedly they delivered this package but um, but exactly as Tarakul said what was the point uh, what was the point of these elections and where their bolder plans um, at the beginning when uh, when this package of reforms was uh, was announced and uh, i have to say i did have expectations in uh, well spring summer 2019 i thought that um uh, there will be some attempts to repopulate a little bit the political scene our barren you know barren political scene uh, and create new parties maybe allow an opposition party uh, in the parliament counting that its radicalism will not be attractive to the majority to the majority of uh, 
uh, of citizens, uh, but then, uh, well, the authorities were scared by by the by the impact of COVID nineteen and also by you know by what was happening in Belarus. Um, so, so if there were plans like that, clearly they they they, they have been reduced, uh, and as a result, we had just some rebranding of old parties. So Nuratan had rebranding in 2019. Then we had, uh, well, Berlin became Adal, and you know, uh, Communist Party dropped communist uh, from 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 the title. Uh, so and then we had highly controlled elections, insulated from any opposition, and insulated as much as possible from independent uh, independent observers. And as was already mentioned uh, by uh, by Evgeny and, and Tarakul, the rules of the game were already heavily in favor of Nuratan. And even these rules were rewritten the last the last minute and uh, the there were these uh, uh, rigid restrictions on uh, independent observers. So which I guess tells us something about the level of uh, uh, well, about the perceptions of the competitive, competitiveness and the popularity of the party, um, their own perceptions of their competitiveness. And uh, that's with all the privileges, all resources that Nuratan has at its uh, uh, disposal, it is not ready for more or less free and fair uh, competition. Uh, and well, if you if you look at other dominant parties, let, let's let's look at the Singapore's People's Action Party, which is the role model of the the dominant parties. It it, it didn't have to go to these lefts. So um, I think it, apart from um, apart from this choice for non-free and non-fair elections to ensure the victory, probably it's worth noting uh, our kind of um, preference for the fake numbers. Uh, to demonstrate this overwhelming support. So you need to have, you know, like 80%, 90%, you know, um, and that's, uh, I think, uh, this myth of the overwhelming support uh, is a big psychological impediment um, as well. So what, what is what is the plan? Um, we keep hearing about the modernization of the party and uh, of the party system, but 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 Nuratan people themselves, they talk about the, the kind of the need of modernization. And um, and it seems that that now they will be they're trying to do it from inside without the help of external inter-party competition. Uh, well, now, well, today's news that that 76 percent of seats in the Majlis uh, were allocated to Nuratan, and uh, we saw the list of uh, people, and they say that that uh, the uh, the um, Nuratan faction will be 70 percent renewed, so we'll have new people, uh, new people in the Majlis, and some of these people um, are, are interesting, you know, kind of more alive, and you know, now you have Idos Sarim on the list, you have. Uh, Kanat Nur up on the list. So, um, and uh, so we kind of, that's an indication that they want to energize a little bit, you know, uh, um, the life in the Majlis and in, inside the party. Uh, and uh, is such renewal from, from inside possible? Uh, some people whose opinion I respect think it's possible and it's that, that we see a, a positive development. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, I'm skeptical about the, the kind of the, the prospects of genuine genuine renewal and modernization, uh, and uh, they keep saying about about kind of the need of evolution rather than revolution. But uh, they seem to forget that uh, competition is the main uh, the main mechanism driving the evolution, and we don't have competition. Uh, so uh, what next? Um, well, as Trakul said, uh, these elections didn't change anything. They didn't change. They, they preserved the status status quo. But uh, but I think by doing this, by preserving the status quo, they changed something. Um, I think they didn't strengthen, but they reduced the legitimacy of uh, of the system in the in the eyes of many politically aware uh, aware citizens, and um, and that will have that will have consequences. And um, and as uh, as Evgeny said, the the uh, there is demand. I think there is demand for change. Um, there is a youth that 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 demands change, and 
And we saw this demand on change in the presidential elections when so, the turnout was fairly good and, and there were so many people voted for, for, uh, for Kasanov. Um, so, so that's, that's my, my input. Thank you. is for um, the situation. I think the three presentations were great, and that really gives us a lot of the kind of overview of the difficulties of the governments of trying to find a way to manage and move forward. We have a lot of questions coming, so I will try to put them together in a, a concise way, if possible. There are some questions that are directly, directed directly, specifically to some of uh, our speakers, so I will begin with that. Uh, Toroku, there was a question for you because you mentioned that uh, having to do the COVID test was an impediment for participation uh, uh, as an observer in the election. And so you were asked to, by some of our audience to clarify, does that mean that people were unable to get the test to, to prove that they were negative before becoming an observer? So that's one question. For for Evgeny, we have a question about you. You, you mentioned in your presentation that the turnout was quite low in a big urban centers, especially in Almaty. And so the question is that do you think that there is a significant urban rural divide and that the rural population would be more voting more favorably for new OTAN and the urban population less or so something that would be quite similar to what we see in fact in Russia in relation to the presidential party, this kind of urban divide, uh, urban rural divide, or you think that the, the urban population is also kind of uh, the, not really interested in, in looking at the at the, in supporting the government. And then, uh, uh, Nargi, there was a question uh, for you. In fact, two questions. One is, uh, someone is uh, mentioning us that there was no chance of voting against all this time. So this is why voters in the are said to have made their ballots invalid. There was a question asking if you or, or any of the other speakers have information on that, and do we know the number of invalid votes? And so, again, for uh, um, uh, Nargi, is about uh, the return uh, of Dariga Nazarbayeva to the Majlis, does that tell us something about the inter elite uh, power struggles that can be happening uh, in this kind of difficult time? So a lot of questions, and we will do a second round of, of uh, question uh, after you answer. So maybe let's go um, in the in in a different order. Uh, Torokul, would you like just to clarify the point on the COVID test? Um, um, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand the uh, question, but it was about coronavirus test, right? Um, it was uh, yeah. Uh, it was at the beginning. Um, uh, said uh, by the chief sanitary doctor that representatives of political parties, uh, members of the election commission, uh, observers uh, want to uh, present, uh, uh, present their COVID-19 negative test results um, in order to enter the polling stations. But somehow on that day, um, uh, on the election day, um, many of my colleagues uh, in Kazakhstan in different cities, uh, they faced a problem when they were um, trying to uh, come to the polling station as a journalist and they were asked for um, a coronavirus negative test result. And uh, some of my colleagues, for example, Ayana Kalmurad was trying to um, tell them that, no, this is not for journalists uh, and I am a, I am a journalist. Uh, I'm not an observer, but um, uh, the chief, um, uh, the head of the election uh, polling station was trying to kick him out of their uh, polling station. And these kind of situations uh, repeated in several cities with my several colleagues, and not only with journalists of Fazatek, but uh, we know that uh, with journalists of different other media companies as well. And uh, the same thing happened uh, with uh, um, independent observers. Uh, first of all, many independent observers um, uh, had uh, their coronavirus tests, for example, in some uh, private centers, test centers. Uh, but their results were found 
uh, later um, uh, illegitimate because uh, they um, somehow did not have uh, permission to have tests or some other problems. Uh, authorities were trying to explain it, uh, but they created, as I said, different types of obstacles, you know, just saying, changing the rules uh, at the end of the, like in last days, for example, you know that uh, before the election, one week before Kazakhstan still was uh, in holiday, uh, after New Year holiday, there was an um, uh, Orthodox Christmas holiday and not every um, poly uh, test centers did not did work and they many people could not get their uh, test results in time and talking about the servers that was the public uh, of uh, some observers, they, they were saying the same things that many people among the observers, dozens of observers, could not enter the uh, polling stations because of the uh, absence of the test results. Thank you, Torokula. Evgeny, can I give you the floor on the rural urban divide question? Uh, yes, for sure. First of all, it's clear that in the urban areas, especially in the big cities, the protest activity is much higher. There is more organizations, political parties, or civic activists or bloggers. And the, in these cities, it's easier to organize independent observance of the observation of the elections. Thus, uh, traditionally, in the cities, the, in the big cities, the real figures, or at least figures which were obtained by the independent observers, differs from the rural areas. In rural areas, there is no not so many. Uh, observers, uh, first of all. Secondly, in the rural areas, uh, the people used to vote, as it was in the Soviet times. They are coming to the polling stations not really for voting, but more for, it's for some kind of event which they are attending uh, on, the, on the Sunday and so on. Of course, to a certain extent, it's changed to some extent in 2019 during the presidential elections. And because it was visible that even in the rural areas, the opposition candidate uh, got some votes uh, more than before. But in general, yes, there is some kind of difference between these uh, uh, urban areas and the rural areas. And we ha I have to mention another point uh, about the internet and social networks. Of course, social networks are much more developed and used in the urban areas, in the big cities. And the uh, people in the rural areas are getting information mostly from the uh, state media. And uh, that's, they have the only information they're getting from there. And as I told you before in my presentation, these media are upper governmental for sure. They are not independent and they are, of course, uh, biased. And the opposition that did not appear, does not appear at this media. That result of that, yes, there is a huge difference, but it's not only the difference that the rural area is voting more for the uh, for the uh, ruling party. It's more like the combination of different factors, including the access to information, including the access to opposition, lack of independent media, a, a lack of internet, and so on. And finally, of course, it's about, again, about the weather, about the climate, about the winter, about the pandemic. All these together, the factors contribute in this outcome, uh, but, but of course, First of all, it's the result of lack of political competitiveness and uh, lack of the space for competitive competition. Thank you so much, Evgeny. Um, Nagis, can I give you the floor? Yes. Can we had right. Um, well, I was trying now to, to check the website of the Central Election Commission on the, the uh, but, but but on on Facebook, Sergey Domnin posted that out of seven point five, according to the Central Election Commission, out of seven point five million um, voting, uh, how how do you call them, uh, forms, uh, seven point two were the correct ones, which which means three hundred thousand were spoiled. Um, ballots, yeah, um, was spoiled, so that 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 keeps you know some information. Um, and as for uh, return of the Ikan Azerbaijan to the uh, to the parliament to the Majlis, uh, well, it's I guess it was expected, and uh, definitely there is a, uh, there is a comp intra elite uh, intra elite competition struggle. 
Um, and uh, and I, I think the since we didn't like we don't have a really kind of political political competition and proper political parties, uh, more of this struggle will be happening under the rug. And uh, which means there will be, you know, kind of more compromise around and uh, more more arrests and uh, and uh, that, that the competition will be sort of, you know, happening in that channel. Um, under the rug behind behind the scene, rather than, you know, kind of going through the, the political competition and competition of political parties. Great. So let's go for a second round of uh, question, and here also I will try to distribute uh, them. Um, Navi, there was a question about uh, foreign policy issues and how they can appear or not appear in the relationship between Tokayev and Nazarbayev. Do we have any information of different foreign policy perception that could potentially emerge between uh, Tokayev and Nazarbayev? Then for Evgeny, we had a question. So Nargis mentioned the fact that uh, 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 Evgeny, um, sorry, Nargis mentioned issues of uh, the fact that there was a new faces emerging on the new OTAN uh, list, and so some of our uh, audience is asking Evgeny also to comment on the fa fact that they had these new faces, more women, more representative of younger generation emerging on the new OTAN list, and I would like to have Evgeny's perception of that uh, potential uh, evolution. And for Toroku, there was a question about the, the prospect for protest movement like OYAN Kazakhstan. Do we see anything about how they could try to uh, be more active and uh, take a kind of uh, and become more empowered by the fact that many people are disappointed by the, the, the lack of uh, political reform that it was promised? So maybe let's go in another order. Nargis, would you like to take the first question on the foreign policy potential disagreements between Tokayev and Nazarbayev? Well, I don't see uh, major disagreements. I think pretty much the the course remains uh, the course remains the same, and uh, um, and it's you know multi-vector balancing balancing foreign policy trying to be on good terms with uh, with all the big uh, big actors i think that will that will continue um but in terms of like foreign policy international context uh, that sort of helps uh, it helps nuratan kind of uh, continue foster this discourse that we are providing stability we are you know protecting the state and you know let's let's be let's have solidarity let's be unified there are you know kind of risks uh, uh, risks and threats out, out there so um so that that's being that's being uh, that's being used um so no i don't see major differences Thank you. Evgeny, would you like to comment on the, the fact that there are more women and younger people on the new OTAN list? Uh, yes, for sure. I agree with Nargis that it is the attempt to energize to a certain extent the uh, members of the parliament from the new OTAN party. Some people are visible, uh, like Aido Sarim, like uh, Kanat Nurov, like some others. Uh, it is the attempt to bring some new blood to a certain extent, with the full control, being loyal and be following the general uh, line of the uh, of the Nuratan party, but at the same time, to bring some kind of communication and connection between the society and these new faces, which have certain kind of roots inside the society, have certain kind of links with the different organizations, some kind of scientific circles and so on. This is the effort to, 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 to rebrand to a certain extent, or to, 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 to bring some new blood. I don't think that it will change too much in general, but at least in certain ways, something will be more sensible. At least sometimes I'm tired about this uh, old MPs with the lack of knowledge uh, of, of the, how the civilized world is developing and uh, where it is going, uh, what, what, what is the, let's say so, the, um, velocity of, of changes, 
and this will bring some kind of common, more common sense, some technocratic approach, and so on. Some like uh, Sarim will uh, express more in a more in a better way some nationalistic sentiments. Some bring some kind of ideas. In general, it's but it, I don't think that it will change anything. At least, at least will improve some small pieces of the legislation or some kind of reaction of the parliament of what is going on in the society in the country. Thank you. So, Rogol, would you like to take the question on the, the potentiality for protest? Uh, yes, Marlene. Before, uh, before answering that question, can I um, continue the previous question? Of course. Just, to, just to ask uh, Evgeny um, about the quota for women and uh, youth. How do you think? Um, I, I haven't seen the full uh, list of new uh, members of the parliament, but uh, do you think there, um, how to say, the, the quota which was already presented during the campaign will be saved in the parliament, or we will see mainly male dominated uh, <laughs> all star deputies? Uh, I think I will answer briefly. Uh, that I think, yes, of course, they will try to keep certain kind of this quota, but again, it's about women and uh, and youth. That it's very difficult to be with the ratio between these two categories, which is which will be put under the quota. But I'm looking at this situation in a much more, let's say so, humoristic way, because for me, uh, it's no difference whether the male, female or youth is representing the Nurotan party. It's, for me, it's not so big difference. <laughs> let's put it this way. Of course, if it will be a real competition and real, uh, let's say, political uh, challenges and different parties, of course, then we should think how it is, let's say, so in the parliament represented. But in this situation, it, it does not change too much. So this also shows the main slogan of these elections, elections without choice, yeah? Like, uh, yeah. Uh, and about the um, question um, you asked about uh, the perspect um, perspectives of growing or not growing the protest mood, uh, I'm sure it will definitely grow uh, because it has um, there are several reasons for that. Um, uh, there, as we have seen um, in previous uh, early presidential elections of 2019, there were actually officially uh, this is a figure uh, provided by the minister of internal affairs 4000 people were detained um in june 19 and uh, uh, this two days ago according to different figures there were hundreds hundreds of uh, protesters uh, despite the you know freezing cold weather uh, despite coronavirus um and i think uh, the disagreement or um this you know protest mood is just growing and uh, this is also because of that listening state concept does not work. If and everything will depend, uh, I think now uh, on authorities' decision and their actions and on the you know if they are ready able to correct the um, you know concept uh, in the future, uh, will they really listen to demands of the um, uh, of Kazakhstanis? uh will they really uh, will this new parliament really discuss and show um that you know to to bring the real uh, uh problems for discussions or not and but probably you know we will see the same um type of parliament as it as we had for five years um you know in the last five years in that case um i'm sure the protest mood will grow and uh, I'm afraid only on one thing that it might be radicalized more and more. Thank you very much for these uh, answers. We still have 15 minutes, so I would like to do a, a new round of uh, question. And these questions are kind of a little bit broad, broader. I think that the, the first two kind of more looking on, on a long term uh, perspective. We had one question. Of the possible use by the government of a more national patriotic ideology in order to kind of 
create some unity where when it can be missing and the fact that Aido Sarim became one of the deputy of Nur OTAN could be potentially seen as this kind of the ruling party looking at national as a new way of legitimation. So would like to have your opinion on, on that uh, kind of potential national patriotic orientation. Second, we had a question about the fact that, okay, we often try to look at the potential for protest. What about looking at the forces of the issue that still bind citizens to the state and that make that Kazakhstani citizens are still kind of fine with an authoritarian model. So what can we say that still makes citizens accepting functioning in an authoritarian regime? Is that the, 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 the fear of destabilization? Is that still hope for some economic prospect? I mean, what are the, the binding elements? And, and a more nationalist ideology may be potentially uh, one of them. And then uh, uh, third question also relates to the so what about the fact that during the time of the election or a little bit before, we had some Russian Duma MPs making new irredentist uh, statements about uh, Kazakhstan and we had some uh, uh, Kazakh reaction uh, to that. So how does that uh, relationship to Russia feel into or is in inscribed into the campaign, even if it was not very visibly uh, 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 formulated and last point what was the role of the namus group versus the protesters so you see questions that are more about the kind of the legitimacy of the state and what still links the population and the state together so maybe let's go let's go in the the, the first order of uh, our presenters evgeny would you like to begin and picking some of these elements of these questions yes of course i'm sorry my uh, video camera switched off unfortunately, but I hope I have uh, heard. First of all, I want to turn some attention to the last article of the president of Kazakhstan, which was published in Kazakhstan's Pravda, and which to a certain extent turned to some historical issues, traditions, culture, language, and so on. I think that to a certain extent, the authorities are looking for some kind of legitimization and some kind of uh, let's say so of funding of looking for mobilization for what they could rely on and of course this national i could not say nationalistic but uh, some kind of these national sentiments of course of this use that's i think that to a certain extent Irlan karin who is working in the presidential administration i do him who will be now in the parliament have to promote this kind of sentiments have to promote these ideas to move forward with that, because they are seeing a lot of, uh, let's say, of the rise of the protest movement in the rural areas, especially among the Kazakh youth. And they try to control this. They try to keep the hand on that, because they do not have any other ideology to move. They will try to do it very, uh, let's say, very carefully, because at the same time, they created uh, this committee on inter-ethnic relations and they will try to to balance on that but of course they will choose this and it will be visible in the parliament this as a, some kind of legit legitimization tool and mobilization tool i don't think that it will turn to some kind of disorder or something like that but it will be very difficult to keep it under the full control especially after the these cordai events which shock kazakhstan to a certain extent that's it's very complicated, but I think that this type of mobilization and legitimization will be on the certain rights. It will be used for, for let's say, for keeping the control uh, and the, all, over the ideological sphere of the country and so on. That's, uh, that's why this article, for me, was very, very uh, looking at the signal in that regard. Evgeny Torokul, uh, uh, would you like to comment on these questions? Um, actually, not so much to add uh, to um, uh, what already Evgeny said, uh, because I absolutely agree with uh, uh, what he said. Uh, just one thing to mention. Uh, you know, this is this was, um, I think, not a coincidence um, that this um, comments from a state, a Russian state Duma, uh came just uh, like uh, one month 
almost one month uh, ahead of the elections. Uh, and it was uh, like um, fueled with some more uh, extra comments from the other public figures in Kazakhstan. And just um, several days ahead of that, uh, in President's article, it was also kind of, you know, referred to that, saying that we have a history. And, you know, this is, um, I think this was, uh, as Evgeny mentioned, it was used and it will be used. Uh, this, um, you know, national sentiment, um, uh, patriotic, um, you know, this kind of mood. Uh, will be probably used uh, because we saw um, some certain uh, figures um, from um, national patriotic um, uh, kind of camp. They are joining to the parliament. And, um, you know, this, this will probably grow. Um, uh, overall, what it might uh, like tell about, I think this uh, elections, election campaign was overall was very, very boring. And, um, and um, in certain, some a certain um, point, this um, what was created, uh, and I'm sure it, it was created, uh, there's a scandal with a state Duma deputies, was also kind of a tool to bring the public attention from something else um, away from the election, probably. And turnout was actually not a problem for authorities. Uh, that people might not come to the uh, polling stations. Um, you know, that is why um, I think this is very dangerous um, thing to, you know, to, to play with um, in the country. Uh, but unfortunately, I think we will see more and more this type, this type of things. Uh, why, uh, as Evgeny mentioned, this is a good tool to consolidate um, you know, the country around the power, around the government, already like legitimate. And um, if you, you know, do not support it, there is a threat from right side, from the left side. So this, you know, this is overall, it sounds very, very dangerous. I think and authorities and especially parliament should um, like think about it. Thank you, Turukul. Um, Nargis? Yes, uh, well, on um, on what uh, what Evgeny said, I, I, I fully I fully agree. I think for the past three decades, um, the legitimacy of the government was drawing on two things, and uh, the first and the main one was state building. You know, uh, we we need we we needed to build the build, build the new state, and you know, kind of uh, foster that. And the second um, the second was opening up the country, linking to global markets. You know, people can travel, people can uh, can uh, sort of uh, do do business, and you know, all that. So um, and now the uh, kind of we built the state. The statehood is there, and in the absence of ideology, you need to rely on something, and kind of this. The, the, the national nationalism, nationalist ideas are this kind of natural, natural, you know, thing to go to. Uh, so and uh, and we've seen it for a while already. I think kind of more and more trying to tap into uh, these sentiments and kind of trying to manipulate them and uh, um, make them kind of constructive rather than destructive for 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 the regime so so it's it's not a new thing and uh, we'll see more of that um and uh, once again if the clamp on uh, kind of ideological competition you know kind of uh, other political parties with other other agendas there will be kind of there will be the only channel open um so so yes, that, that will be my, my take on the situation. Thank you so much. We still have five minutes, so let's go for, uh, we, we still had a one uh, or two small question about the, the politi political activism varying or not depending on the language. So if some of you could comment on the, the difference between the, the speaking and the Kazakh speaking information sphere and the way they are discussing uh, the election and also something more on social media. It was already mentioned by Evgeny, but we have a question about the role of social media 
in uh, providing other kind of um, uh, freer uh, information. And one question was specifically about the, the use of Telegram of or other new social media tools, as we have seen, for example, during the Belarus protests. So do we see this kind of uh, social media opposition tools emerging? And what about the differences between the Russian-speaking and the Kazakh-speaking? information space in relations to, to, to the state. And if I can give you very briefly, like one minute or two minutes each uh, to comment on these two points uh, would be great. Nagis, would you like to begin? I think I would give the floor to Toroku. Probably he knows better. Okay. And then Evgeny after. Uh, thank you. I think um, the role of social media and especially this uh, anonymous channels will only grow. Um, you know, now I don't know uh, who doesn't know uh, anonymous channels in Telegram among Kazakh journalists who I talked to. Um, you know, and, and we we hear almost always, and some predictions are coming true. And um, and I think for young people especially, this is um, very useful, um, easy. Uh, they do not almost use television, uh, you know, watch television, uh, and there is no almost no newspaper, only on so social media. But about the, um, you know, it will just grow. But I would just talk about like language differences. What you said um, in our coverage, what we see, um, uh, Azatik has a website and a YouTube channel. Uh, what is interesting, on, on our website, uh, we mainly um, publish texts and our Russian, we have to by language, by language um, site, our Russian page has twice more readers than Kazakh uh, website, but uh, on YouTube, we have 90% of comments in Kazakh. You know, I think it might tell about something. That's it, my one minute. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Toroko. Uh, Evgeny, would you like to give us the last comments? Yes, uh, very brief. Uh, the first one is about the influence. I think that as for now, we do not have really political space, free political space. I don't think that so, uh, social networks are playing significant role in that regard. That's not so many people are uh, using social networks and so on. Yes, this is the active part of population. Yes, they are uh, watching, they are expressing their views, they are commenting, but I do not think that it is, uh, in, in that regard it's changed too much because the whole space is practically locked uh, politically. There is no any kind of ways and channels to express your political ideas and so on. But I agree totally with it, Toroku, that it will grow, no doubts about that. Secondly, about the language, I want to mention another issue of that regard. The uh, vast majority of Kazakhs are bilingual. They could speak in both languages, that they are attending both sides. They're attending Kazakhs and Russian. They could comment in both languages absolutely freely with a very good knowledge of both languages. That in the Kazakh sides, we do have the Kazakh editorial uh, journalists in our uh, organizations, which are let's say so editing this uh, Kazakh website and they are providing the information but in general mostly they are attending uh, uh, the site in the Russian language because they could speak freely but the problem is that the Russian speaking population which do not speak Kazakh they are not attending Kazakh websites they are attending only Russian yes of course in the Russian uh, in the websites in the Russian and social networks there is the exchange of opinions between two, both ethnic groups but they are not attending Kazakh websites. And of course, to a certain extent, this information they are getting is different. And the certain way, the discussions which are in the Kazakh segment of the internet are more uh, on the Kazakh issues rather than uh, including the general population. But I, uh, I, but I think that it is inevitable and this will also grow. Thanks. Marlene, can I add one sentence to that? Yes, of course, of course. And if you look at the uh, political political use, they are trilingual. So they speak Kazakh, Russian, and English. So it is changing. I think it, it is changing. The scene is changing. Um, and they are much more aware of what's happening in the world. And, you know, they are savvy on social media. And, you know, they, they build these channels. And, uh, and uh, it, 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 I fully agree. It's, 
it's it is changing. Uh, Marlon, um, do we have time for one question? I I, I wanted to just to clarify uh, with um, Nargis uh, one one moment. Um, uh, you said that um, political kind of battle um, uh, will be now in different um, surface with uh, compromise or with different kind of um, uh, I know seeing yeah it will it will grow rather than in like open political um, uh, discussions probably if I understood co correctly how how about if that is true how about the journalistic investigations um, you probably know that recently about one month ago uh, we are funeral uh, published a, lot, a big investigation about the Nazarbayeva the family of Nazarbayev about their properties in six countries in the world. But, you know, today we heard that she will be in the parliament. Um, how do you see the you know, perspective of this kind of journalistic investigations future, uh, how they will influence or impact the you know, public uh, for politicians? I don't know what will be. How do you what do you think? Well, it's a bunch of questions, Trakul. Uh, well, uh, it's nothing new. I think kind of that that's how the, the political struggles took place, right? And then they got sort of re-energized with the political political transition and all the kind of challenges and opportunities this political transition uh, created. Uh, so I, I think the, the kind of if you had a if you if we posted a political party like more genuine political party system that could have moved there you know kind of the political to the arena of political competition but but since we are not uh that will remain where where it was you know so that will be an under the rug uh, under the rug struggle and we will have like this you know bulldogs thrown out you know and uh, um and as for the kind of corruption investigation I, it, once again, I mean, it will be. It's it's highly selective. We know how anti-corruption campaign, you know, takes place in countries like ours. You know, so uh, some people go to prison, some people don't go to prison. Some people go to prison very briefly, and then they are, you know, kind of released and uh, their property is returned. And you know, so so it's 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 a game, and the rules of the game are not clear to the outsiders, and probably not very clear to the insiders <laughs> insiders as well. So. Uh, but I, 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 I think it's it's very important what uh, investigative journalism is doing, what what uh, what people like you are doing, and uh, this should be uh, this information should be available to the public. Uh, but then, of course, it will be important that, that the public will you know will feel upset about it rather than kind of accept. Okay, you know that's that's how things are. You know. Um, so, so I mean, all of us have a lot of work to do, uh, journalists and you know, <laughs> and all, all citizens um, to 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 this one, in this or that way. So, thank you. Great. Well, I think on that on that topic, it's a good way to conclude our discussion. It was really a wonderful overview of the situation. Thank you to our three great speakers and thank you to the audience for being so proactive and asking so many questions. There were plenty of some of other questions that, that we didn't have time to ask, so I apologize. For, for those who didn't get an answer to their question. But once again, thank you. And uh, please stay in touch and join us for our next seminar on January 26th, where we will take some historical perspective by looking at China's uh, role in, in uh, uh, Xinjiang and Central Asia at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. So uh, history is also telling us a lot about what is happening uh, now. So once again, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and hope to see you very soon for all the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.